Right. So you received feedback on the Coursework One. I think the main the main feedback and it is quite common for Coursework One is try to pay a bit more attention to explanations. Um, I think the simulation results were correct, but often students do not provide enough explanations, enough rationals. So write down the equation, explain how you obtain the degrees of uh, the um, the diversity gain, um, you have to explain exactly how you do that. Um, so that's quite important. You have to show that you really understand the content, essentially. Um, so you will see the coursework tool try to to actually leverage the comments you received or the feedback you received and try to improve in the coursework, coursework tool. Um, right, so Longfei and Yang will also schedule some orals for coursework three, right? As I mentioned, coursework three is on Blackboard, so feel free to have a look at this. I really encourage you to have a look at this. Uh, but Longfei and Yang will schedule the oral that will be for the last week of the term, which will be the orals will be scheduled on 25th and 26th of March. Um, and the last thing is you have coursework two is now coming. The deadline is this Sunday. Um, right, if I'm not mistaken, the deadline is this coming Sunday, right? So, um, good. Right. Um, so let's continue what we were doing last uh, last week. Right, we we're looking at multi-user communication, and we looked at the multiple access channels and the broadcast channels. So the the, the uplink and the downlink. Uh, we started first with single antenna systems, and then we moved to multi antenna systems for the uplink for the multiple access channel. Um, and so the big uh, the big difference, the big summary that we had is that in the multiple access channel, essentially we were looking at um, a region like this here, that is a capacity region for these two user case, that is a pentagon, and that is characterized by essentially three inequalities. So two are single user inequality and one is on the sum rate on R1 plus R2. And we discussed how we can achieve any points actually in this region, but more interestingly, any points on the boundary of that region, right? Um, and so in particular, point A here or point A there and point B there are obtained using a successive interference cancellation and you obtain A or B depending on which user you decode first. Right, so then we moved on to the broadcast channels, which is the downlink. And there we see that we also use a successive interference cancellation, um, but the, we have to do this in a, very carefully. We use actually superposition coding with successive interference cancellation, and the user that is the strongest one is the user actually that decode the message of the weaker user. So we have two users in the system, but you could have more, obviously. Um, and in, in this, the two user case, essentially, one of the user, the strong user with the strongest channel gain, will decode the message of the other user, right? Um, and then you allocate a certain power location to those two different users, S1 and S2. And by adjusting the power location, by changing this pair of power location, you can actually obtain this capacity region. So any pair of power location S1 and S2 will give you a different point on this uh, boundary here. Right, so that's superposition coding with, uh, with SIC. Um, right, so you will see in coursework three, um, there is um, th this literature is well known for for a long time, for almost fifty years, for the single user case, uh, for the single antenna case. Sorry, um, but this has been kind of revived in in the past few years under the name of NOMA or non orthogonal multiple access, which is nothing less than what what we have here with superposition coding with SIC. Um, and you will see that actually in coursework three, there is a bonus questions where you have to actually read a recent paper that tries to debunk uh, some um, 
some of the misunderstanding and misconception about, about NOMA when it's applied to multi-antenna settings. So a lot of people apply these techniques of superposition coding with SIC to multi-antenna settings. And what we show in that paper, actually, this is not, this is not really a good, uh, a good strategy. So, so you will see that in that paper, and it's, um, it, it's part of a clear bonus question in course three, which is, which is quite new this, uh, this, uh, this year. So those two bonus questions you have in course work three are clear new. Right, so you will, uh, you will, you will play with, with those notions of multiple access and broadcast channel superposition coding with SIC and the relationship with, with uh, multiple access channels. Um, you will see this in that course work three. Uh, it would be a good exercise for you to understand. Right. Then we looked at uh, one important thing in the broadcast channel is that if we want to maximize the sum rate, uh, this is very different from the multiple access channel. If in the broadcast channel, if we want to maximize the sum rate, we actually allocate power to only one user. So we had this here somewhere. Um, Right, so we had this here somewhere. If you write R1 plus R2, you have the sum, the sum rate. Um, this is the sum rate here. And actually, to maximize this term, S1 has to be equal to ES. And so what you end up with is just the, the, the sum rate of this, uh, of this broadcast channel, which will be equal to uh, simply log 2, 1 plus uh, uh, ES multiplied by H1. So this is actually the rate of user one. Right, so in other words, um, again, to maximize the sum rate, to achieve the sum rate, we just transmit to one user at a time, always a strong user. Right? That's quite different from the multiple access channel. Here in the multiple access channel, we actually, to achieve the sum rate, which is any point here on this region here, on this uh, phase here, would actually be achieved by always having the multiple users uh, scheduled together, right? So to achieve that point here, the two users have to transmit at, at the full transmit power. So they would be scheduled together, um, which is different in the broadcast, in the single antenna broadcast channel, so the size of this. Right, so let's move on to um, the multi-antenna case. So we had the MIMO MAC, so the multiple antenna case in the uplink. Um, and so here we could have multiple antennas at the transmitters, we could have multiple antennas at the receiver. And one scenario that we looked at in particular is the SIMO MAC. So I have single antennas at the users, but I have multi-antenna at the receiver. Uh, and it's an uplink, right? So. The, so what we saw here, we looked at the capacity region of this case, and in the two user again, we had two constraints, R1 and R2. Uh, so single user rate, so the rate of user 1 and user 2 had to be smaller than the rate in there if they are alone in the system. And then I have the rate of user 1 plus user 2, so the sum rate has to be smaller than what we have here. And so this actually, uh, what, what this was telling us, and what I, I showed you in, 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 the, in the last uh, term, is actually in the last lecture, is that actually this is very reminiscent of what we have in point-to-point -point MIMO. Essentially, this is the same as looking at a point-to-point -point system where we have, let's say, two streams that we transmit. We do spatial multiplexing, two independent streams, stream one from antenna one, stream two from antenna two. And the sum rate of this point-to-point -point MIMO is actually correspond here to the, the sum rate of this um, of these two users' SIMO multiple access channel. So it's it's um, it's uh, the same techniques actually applied in those two, two scenarios. So what we what we showed here is that in this uh, SIMO case, SIMO MAC, what you do is that to achieve the corner points. You have again um, a pentagon like this. You achieve two corner points here. So same idea as what we have in size of case. To achieve the corner points here, essentially the one of the user, the user one, will decode the message of user two. 
And here, user two will decode the message of user one. And so here, at this point here, we have a rate R1, R2 prime. And so R1 will be this. That's the rate of user one. That's the, the rate you would achieve if it's alone in the system. That's the sum rate I have. So the sum rate minus the rate of user one give me the rate R2 prime at this point A here. And this is actually, you see the argument here of this log is actually the same expression as an SINR, um, SINR when we do MMSC receiver. So this is actually the, um, this is actually obtained, this solution is actually obtained by doing, uh, you apply an MMSC receiver, you actually um, decode uh, R2 and then, or, or user two streams, and then you remove it from the received signal and you perform SIC and you decode user one rate. So the pair R1, R2 prime is obtained by doing MMSC SIT, which is what we can use in point-to-point -point channels as well. When we have a MIMO case, you can use MMSC SIC. I have not gone into the details, but you can show that MMSC SIC for initial realization is actually capacity achieving, right? So that's the best thing you can do. Um, if you look at error probability, it's not the best thing. Uh, for a finite rate, uh, for a finite constellation. Um, so you see that the ML decoder would perform better. But from a rate perspective, when you have infinite block lengths, you have Gaussian uh, signaling and so on, MMSC SIC is actually capacity achieving. And this is the reason why actually here in, in the, the SIMO Mac is also uh, MMSC SIC is actually sufficient. Right. Now, if you have a BC, um, so if you have um, if you have a, a BC, you have now multiple transmit antennas and multiple receive antennas, right? In the darling, so now you may have a transmitter that may equip with multiple antennas, and then you may have a receiver that may also be equipped with multiple receive antennas, right? It's now it's a downlink, right? So here the idea is a bit more complicated um, than what we have in, in in the single antenna case. In the single antenna case, we were doing superposition coding with, with SIC. Here in this case, our system model now looks like something like this. I have a receiver observation Y1 here, Y2 there, right? I have a channel matrix H1 for user one, H2 for user two. And I have now a, a vector of transmitted signals here, C prime that incorporate all the messages I want to deliver to user one and user two. User one and user two could receive multiple stream of information because they have multiple receive antennas. Right. Now, we will not go into the, all the details of this, um, but the important message is that the capacity region, when you know the chance of the transmitters, this is known, and so this can be characterized, and is obtained by something that is called dirty paper coding. That's the best strategy that we can um, we can come up with, and the idea is is different from superposition coding with SIC. Superposition coding with SIC, you can view this as a form of interference cancellation at the receiver side. You see, one of the user, the strong user, cancel the interference from the other users. Dirty paper coding is a form of interference cancellation at the transmitter side, so at the the, the base station. Right, so supervision coding with SIC when you have a um, signal antenna system like this, you perform SIC here at the receiver, so you cancel the interference at the receiver. So if you like, receiver one will cancel the interference that the message of user two was uh, creating. Here, when we have multi antenna, if you apply superposition coding with SIC, this is clearly suboptimal when you have multiple antennas. And so the way to go is something called dirty paper coding, where this idea of interference cancellation is actually performed at the transmitter side. So it's, the, it's formed in the way the uh, information is encoded. Now, why it has this funny name of dirty paper is because essentially the idea is 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 writing on dirt so dirt is in the interference but if you know the interference at the transmitter side uh, the interference actually any message will create and this is something that you know when you know the channels perfectly the transmitter the idea is that you 
leverage the knowledge of the interference in the encoding mechanism, right? So we're not going into any of those details. That's well beyond the the content of this course. If you're interested, you can go into in, into the book. This is this is explained. Um, but it's just to tell you that actually this is not the same strategy as superposition coding with SIC. Now, what we will do uh, in this lecture is we'll look at some other strategies than DPC um, that is used in, in practice, that is used in, in reality, um, and that is less complex and that performs quite well. So DPC is information theoretic optimal, but it's very complex to implement. And so, so far, no systems use that. Um, so what we look at is actually how we can use some form of linear precoding, something that we know already, we have played a lot with linear precoding, how we can use linear precoding to actually uh, you know, play with multi-user transmission in, in the downlink. Right, so this is what we're going to do in this, um, in this lecture. We're going to look at um, primarily the downlink scenario of um, transmitters serving multiple receivers, and you can have single or multiple antennas. And um, the idea is, can also be applicable in, in the uplink, so some aspect of it, so the notion of fairness and scheduling, those notions would be applicable in the downlink and the uplink. The notion of precoding that we have here is primarily applicable in, in the downlink, right? In the uplink, we already know what to do. Uh, we can simply do MMSC SIC, for instance. Or you could do something else. If you do simply MMSC or zero forcing, if you have multiple receive antennas in the SIMO MAC, you can do this as well. Any receiver that we have seen in, in the point to point MIMO can be used, um, and you would have different performance. Right, so we'll look at that, and then hopefully by the end of this lecture, we'll start playing with, uh, with, with massive MIMO. Right, so uh, one important notion is when you have multi-user, and it's something that we have seen a little bit already, if I go back to the, the size of BC here, we had this notion here of um, the rate here. The sum rate, we see that we have a maximum, right? So if, if, you, think about, if you think about this, um, what that means is that imagine you have different users, you have a size OBC, so each user has one antenna. And what you do is actually you transmit one stream to one of those antenna. So you pick up the strongest antenna in this network, the strongest receive antenna, and you transmit one stream to that receiver, right, to that antenna. So this actually is called... Um, and uh, this is called multi-user diversity, in a way. You're looking at, you benefit from the fact that you have multiple users in the system. And so by picking up the good users, you actually increase the sum rate in the systems, right? You transmit that only one user at a time here, but you, you pick up the right one, the good one, right? So this is, uh, gives you an increase in the sum rate and you benefit from this because the more users you have, if all those chunks are actually independent from each other, then you actually have this value of this max will increase as the number of users increased, right? So this is actually uh, having multiple users or many users in the system actually is a good thing here in terms of sum rate, because essentially your sum rate will grow larger because the maximum here will, will grow larger as the number of users increase, obviously, because it's, it's a max, right? So this is actually something that is useful in a multi-user context, um, is this presence of many users. So the fading, the fluctuation of the channel is not something that you try to combat because it leads to some form of, you know, um, of deep fade, you try to really leverage it because different users will have actually, will be in the different channel states. And so if I have a user that is in this state and then in that state, this is the time, right? So I have a user in green, for instance, and I have a user maybe in red over time, the good user, the green one will be here, and then the red one will be good at that time here. So at any time instant, actually, I will select a good one. Right, a good user. So this is good to have many users in the system. So the notion of fading 
in the context of multi-user is actually slightly different from what we have in in in, in just point to point on single antenna in single uh, in point to point system we try to use space time coding or diversity method to try to mitigate this uh, fluctuation of the channel in multi-user communication we try to use fading as a source of randomization in order to select the good ones out of these pools of, of, of users and to transmit to that good ones, right, in, in, the, in, the, in the downlink. So you can view this as a form of selection diversity when we were doing antenna selections, right? If you have one transmitter and you have multiple receivers like this, uh, with one antenna and antenna each, you can view this as two antenna systems where actually you select the best antenna, essentially. So it's a form of antenna selections, right? And we have seen that when we do antenna selection, essentially our uh, SNR increase with the number of antenna that we can choose from. So here our uh, SNR after selection, so our sum rate here, will also increase with the number of users that we have. Right. Now what is important in order to, be, to choose the users is that we have to be able to track the user channel fluctuation, right? So if I know the channel at the transmitter, if I know the channel H1 here and I know H2, then I can really know which user is the best one at a given time instant, and so I can select the right user at the right time in order to maximize this uh, capacity, uh, this sum rate, right? So inherently, in, in, this, um, in this figure here, in this sum rate that we had for the BC, Inherently, to do this maximization, you need to know all those channels of the transmitter. If you don't know the channels of the transmitter, you, there is no way you know which, which uh, user is the strongest one, right? And which user you have to schedule to, right? So the assumption here is actually you know already the age of the transmitter, uh, so that you, you can already select the good user. Right. So let's look into this into a bit more detail. So let's imagine that I have no um, uh, certain users. I transmit um, here, I transmit a certain message, right? I'm having a size of BC. So this actually should be just a scalar. This is actually a, a scalar also. Um, and I transmit a certain uh, uh, message here or, or symbol that comes from the superposition coding potentially right and I, I have a receive observation for each of those key users right now when i want to maximize the sum rate essentially i transmit at one user at a time but i transmit to the strong user so my c prime here when i maximize the sum rate and i want to achieve the sum rate capacity the c prime will be essentially the message that I want to deliver to the strong user, right? Because I will transmit only to one user at a time to maximize the sum rate capacity. And the message I will transmit is the message of the strongest user. So I'm selecting the users with the largest channel gain. Right? So if I'm looking at the maximum among all those channel gains, among those K users, Right. The average SNR after selections and therefore the sum rate after selection will scale with, with this, this quantity. Right. The larger this quantity, the larger the uh, SNR after selection of the users or the larger the sum rate. Right. Now this is something that we have seen before. If you assume all those H are independent from each other, this is actually mathematically something that is the same as if you have, let's say, a SIMO point-to-point -point system where you do antenna selections at all those uh, different receive antenna, right? So we can actually calculate what is the average SNR that you can experience when you actually do uh, user selections, right? You select the best user in that pool. Right? So here, we assume that all users have the same channel statistic, they have the same pass loss, 
and the same um, shadowing for the time being, right? So, and so we can maximize, we can compute this quantity just using the relationship that we have seen many lectures ago in antenna selections. And what we saw at that time, we saw that actually this quantity, um, if K is large, if the number of users is large, or in the number of antenna, the number of received antenna is large, we saw that this quantity was scaling as log the number of received antennas. Maybe you remember that, right? So we had something that was scaling as the number logarithmically with the number of received antennas. Here, the number of received antenna is simply replaced by the number of users, right? Each antenna is one user, effectively. So I have essentially, after selection, I will have the SNR after selection of the users, of the strong user, this SNR will scale as log k. So if I increase the number of users in the system, the SNR after selection will increase logarithmically with, with k, which is good, which is good. It means actually the more users I have in the system, the higher you know, the SNR after selection, and then the higher the sum rate. Not so surprising, right, that it's increased, because here in this example, what do we have? Imagine we have only two users. What is the SNR after selection? Well, during that period of time here, um, I mean, this whole period of time here, we, we see that uh, the, the green one, this whole green one here is better. So that's going to be the SNR after selection will be a function of H1. And then uh, at this time instant here, the SNR after selection, right, will be uh, H2, right? So the larger the number of users, the larger the value of blue. You see, the value of blue will actually, the, the, the blue color will actually, the value will, will keep increasing as you have more users in the system, obviously, right? You never will scale the user that is in the deep fade like this because likely you have another user that has a better channel, right? right. So this is where this log k comes from. So that means actually the SNR, this term here, if I go back to my size of BC, Right. I could say roughly that this term here, if all my all my long term SNRs are the same for all the users, so if all the users have the same pass loss, right, it's a big assumption, but assume all the users have the same pass loss, this quantity roughly will scale as log log k. Roughly. Right. SNR uh, multiplied by log k. Right. So that means actually the sum rate will roughly, in the highest SNR regime, will roughly scale the log, log k. So I have the log coming here and I have the second log coming there. So it will scale uh, doubly logarithmically with k, right? Um, so if k increase, the sum rate will increase. It will not increase linearly, right? So it will not be a nice linear increase. It will be a logarithmic increase, doubly logarithmically increase. So it will, it will saturate at some point. So you will have a lot of benefit of bringing more users uh, when you have a small number of users, but if you have a large number of users already, then whether you go from 100 to 150, the gain will not be as significant as if you go from two users to three users, for instance, right? That's what it means. Right, so um, let's go back to this here. Right, so this is this notion of essentially uh, multi-user diversity gain. The diversity gain here um, that scales as log k is a little bit similar to this array gain that we uh, that we had in the antenna selections in point-to-point -point, uh, uh, SIMO system where we had one transmit antenna and we had multiple receive antenna. Right, and we were doing antenna selections, right? So we were doing something like this. We set one antenna at a time. And we had an array gain of log n r, right? That was our array gain. Here, I will not call this array gain, but we call this uh, multi-user diversity gain because those different antennas correspond to different users. So effectively, you could see a form of array gain, but it's not actually increasing the SNR of each user. It's actually increasing the SNR of the selections after uh, after picking up the strong users, right? So it is a multi-user diversity game. 
Right, and so for this, um, you see, obviously, you can have situations where this hold here, this log k, probably holds if all the channel gains, all the passes and shadowing are the same for all the users. Now, you could have situation where you don't have that, right? And in reality, you would not have that, right? If you have something like this, if you have one transmitter and you have a receiver is here and you have another receiver is there, right? So the pass loss of user one and the pass loss of user two are very different from each other. Now, instead of having something uh, that is um, something like this and then something like this, well, you may have something that is constantly like this and something like this, right? So that's my user two. Green one is user one, right? And because the pass loss of user one is much smaller than the pass loss of user two, essentially here I have over time, I have that actually the channel strength of user one um, is actually much, uh, much higher than the channel strength of user two, right? So in that case, in that case, this log 2k here that we have here will not hold anymore because the pass loss are different for those two users. So in that case here, you would still always use a one. So there, uh, we'll see later on, this is not very fair, right? You can still benefit from form of multi-user diversity, well, in the sense that this chance may still fluctuate, so you still actually uh, Schedule the strong users, but actually you will always kill the same user because one user is very dominant compared to the other one, right? So if you have really the same pass loss for the two users and you have independent fading among the two users, this is where the multi-user diversity is very helpful. Um, if you have only one user is very, very dominant compared to the other one, and you schedule that user all the time because he's the dominant one, um, I mean, yes, he's a strong user, so the sum rate will be okay, but uh, you will never scale the other user. So that will lead to a problem of fairness. So multi-user diversity is okay, is good, but you have to be uh, a bit careful about under what assumption you can achieve multi-user diversity. Um, if you have the, relatively the same pass loss for the, all the different users, you can really leverage the multi-user diversity by selecting the strong users. If you have very different pass loss for the different users, um, selecting the strong users only, right, will uh, will not be a good thing in terms of fairness. Right? Here, if you have the same passwords for the different users, it's okay because at some point in time you select user one, then some point in time you select user two, so you can alternate between user one and user two, and you can still, you know, benefit the systems because you only scheduled the strong user at a given time instant. So we we'll look at fairness just in a minute. Right, so, um, so this here essentially tells you uh, roughly what I was telling you a, a minute ago, is that if you look at this sum rate, which is obtained by uh, opportunistic TDMA, you transmit at one user at a time, roughly your sum rate will actually scale as log two of the multi-user like of the multi -user diversity gain. So the multi-user diversity gain, GM, here is given by log k. And so what we're going to have here is something of constant, but essentially plus uh, log log k, right? So if you have a um, larger number of users here, essentially your sum rate will actually increase with the number of users. Good. Um, right. So let's now look at this notion of fairness. So the problem of picking up these strong users here all the time when you have different pass loss is not fair, as I said. Right. So we need to find another way if that happens. And the other way is um, the idea is the following. So imagine that I have, um, again, here, the same example as, as this. I have one user has much smaller pass loss than the other one, but I have something like this. I still have channel fluctuation, I have fading, right? So I have user two is like this. 
and I have a uh, user one is uh, something like this, for instance, right? So if I only choose to pick up the strong user, right, at any time instant to maximize the sum rate of this uh, of this size, so BC here, right? So I have uh, two antennas, receiver two, receiver one. H1 and H2, well, that's H1, that's H2. If I only select one user at a time, I will select user one all the time, not fair, right? User two will never be scheduled. So what can I, what can I do in order to try to um, be more fair? So one idea is the following one. One idea will be to try to schedule the user whenever his channel is good. So here I have two users, and I see that actually, if I look at the average channel strength of user two, I see that user two is actually good here, is good there, is good there, has a good channels compared to its mean, right? But I look at user one. User one has good channels here and here, right? So the idea there, we try to increase, to bring in fairness into the problem is say, Let's not scale the strong user at a time at, at, at a given time instant. Let's try to scale the the users who have a good channels compared to the average. Right? So that means actually here, maybe at this time instance here, I will scale the user two. And then we'll switch to user one here, right? Because user one has a good chance compared to its mean. And then at some point here, we'll go back here maybe to user two, right? And then we'll go back here to user one. You see, because user one and user two will have independent failing because they're located different location in a cell, for instance, or in, in, in the network, they will have independent failing. They will be far away from each other. So the failing will be uncorrelated. And the idea is say, let's try to you know, schedule the user when they're really the chance is close to their peak. So the chance will change over time, and let's schedule them when they are close to their peak. Right? So that's the that's the qualitative idea behind trying to bring in fairness into the system. Right. So how can we formulate this? Well, the way we can formulate this is by bringing a utility metric. So the utility metric says I have a certain number of users in my pool. The k is the number of users in in the system, I have k of them. And if I want to scale one user at a time here, the question is which user do I want to schedule? And so what I could do is introduce a utility metrics u and say the user I will schedule at a certain time instant is the one that maximizes this utility metric. Right. Now we can choose multiple metrics for this. So one of them is simply rate maximization. The other one is more fairness oriented policy. So a common metric for you is simply WK multiplied by RK. So RK is the rate of user K. Let's say a certain time instance, that's the rate of user K. The rate that is achievable by user K. WK is a weight that we add, right? And what we want to do is find the user among all the users, among all these pools of users here, I want to find one user that maximize this product between the weight W and the rate RK. So imagine if I take the weight WK equal to one, right? In that case, it's simply R max RK. Right? So that that's means, in other words, in simply finding the user that maximize incentiveness rates. Or in other words, finding the user that will maximize its SNR. So I transmit one user at a time, or and I just want to find the user that has the largest incentiveness rate, right? Or I, in other words, I just want to find a user that has the largest incentiveness SNR, right? So this is actually a rate maximization approach. This is exactly the same as just simply doing that. When the size of BC here 
when we do the size of BC here, what we say that we transmit at one user at a time, but we transmit to the strong users, right? So each user, each user will achieve a rate if it's uh, if it's transmitted alone in the system of log two one plus ESHQ, right? If I have a rate maximization policy, I transmit to the user that maximize this. So the user that maximize this is the user that has the largest channel gain. This is the max over HQ, right? So the rate maximization uh, policy here is actually the rate, the, the strategy that simply achieves the sum rate capacity of this size of BC. But as, as we have seen, this is not fair because in this example here, the rate maximization policy will schedule user one all the time because user one has the largest channel gain. Right? So you can do that, but it's not fair. A uh, fair approach is called proportional fairness, says that now my weight here is not one, it's not the same for all the users. It's given by something like this. So um, gamma Q is a weight that is function of, let's say, a certain quality of service. Let's imagine user, one of the user requires a higher quality of service than other users, um, then the gamma Q will be larger. For instance, if for one of the users you have an important call, um, while on other users you do streaming. So for instance, in one of the users you have a call that needs low latency and you know reliable uh, transmission, regular transmission, while other users they just do streaming. You have for instance, one user is watching a movie where actually he can simply stream, so he, he downloads a lot of information and then he waits a bit, then download more information, while another one is on a call where actually the packet has to come constantly in order to the, for the call not to be cut, right? So those two lead to two different traffic, type of traffic, and so you could maybe put a higher quality of service on one of them than on the other one because one of the the service, one of the traffic actually is more sensitive than another one, for instance, right? Or gamma Q could be related to how much a user is paying a subscription. For instance, if one user is paying more than another one, well, you want to favor the user that maybe pays more than, than the other one, for instance, right? I mean, you can come up with any potential uh, metrics, right? But more importantly, what is interesting is the denominator. So the denominator is, not, is also RQ, but there is a bar there, right? RQ bar. So this is a long-term average rate, a long-term average rate of user Q. Right? And so what you see here is essentially what you do is that you don't maximize, in, in, in the second one, you don't maximize RQ, so you don't maximize the user that has a largest incidence rate, you try to maximize the ratio between in this. I ignore the gamma k for the time being, this is not uh, very important. Um, right, so I have uh, I have this, right, so I maximize now the ratio between an instantaneous rate and kind of long-term average rates. Right? I'm not maximizing just instantaneous rate, I'm maximizing a ratio between instantaneous and average. So this goes back to here. If I have a scenario like here, R1, instantaneous rate of user 1, is always larger than the instantaneous rate of user 2. The channel of user 1 here is better than the channel of user 2 there. So the rate of user 1, the rate of user 1 will be log 2 1 plus ESH1 squared, I mean divided by the node. The rate of user 2 will be log 2 1 plus ES over noise H2. Right? So the rate of user 1 is always larger than the rate of user 2. Right. But the rate of user one divided by an average rate of user one could be a larger or smaller than the rate of user one divided by an average rate of user two. And we'll define average rate in a minute, right? But you can think of average rate of something related to maybe something like the average, the average channel gain here, right? So for instance, the ratio R1 over R1 bar if my R1 bar is somehow my average here, right, 
R1 divided by R1 bar, this one divided by this, you will see actually this is kind of low, right? While here, this actually will be high because R1 will be larger than, than the average, right? Here is actually high, uh, R1, R2 will be higher than R2 bar, kind of, right? So now you're not looking at the absolute rate, you're looking at a relative, you know, rate. The how much the incident rate could be larger than an average rate, right? And so it can happen that user two here is actually a low channel gain, but this ratio here of incentive rate of user two versus his average rate is actually larger than user one who has a better channel, but is actually in a deep phase, right? So this maximizing a kind of ratio like this will try to um, um, encourage the scheduler, so the, the base station, to schedule users when the channels, the, a given user channels is actually close to its peak. The scheduler will not schedule the user when actually it's very low like this, but will try to schedule the channels when when the user is close to his, his channel's peak, right? So this is this is a, a proportional fairness. Um, this is actually something that is very useful. It's used in 4G and, and 5G quite extensively. Um, and this is something you will simulate in, in coursework in coursework three as well. Right, so how do we define RQ bar? So RQ bar is, is something that's changing over time. And it's changing on whether you have been scheduled uh, before or not. So RQ bar is defined as something. At um, let's imagine that you have a certain rate at time k. So you have a time scale like this, right? It's time at zero, time one, time two, time k. Then you have time k plus one, and your channels will change, right, over those different time instants. Right? So at time k, the instantaneous rate of user k, user user q, is given by this. And let's imagine that we have at time k, we have an average rate of user q that is given by R q bar. Now, how we defined the average rate at time k plus one, so here, R q bar at time k plus one, will be as follows. It depends on whether user Q will be scheduled at time K or user Q is not scheduled at time K. So what that means, scheduled at time K, means you have a certain number of users in, 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 the, in the cell, right? You have large K, right? K users, right? And at time K here, you are asked to, to schedule one of those K users, right? So you will transmit data to one of those K users, right? So if you decide to transmit data to user Q, that means user Q has been scheduled at time K. If user Q has not been scheduled at time K, then you go into that loop here. Now, how you this compute this? This is actually computed based on this quantity and this quantity. So actually this quantity is an updated version of RQ bar at time k, and the only difference is the addition of this. So what you see here, you have a parameter TC, which is the scheduling uh, uh, time scale, uh, which is a parameter that you can change, and you will change in coursework three, that roughly speaking tells you how long you have to wait um, before you can schedule a user. So if TC is very large, it means that you may have to wait a relatively long time before you can schedule the user. If TC is small, it means that your given user will, will very likely be scheduled uh, quite on a regular basis. Right, so let me show you what it means. Um, RQ at time k plus one is actually a fraction of RQ at time k, with the fraction is given by one minus one over TC. And we add, if Q was clear at time K, we add a fraction that is given by one over TC multiplied by its instantaneous rate. So we update the average rate at time K with a fraction of the instantaneous rate of user Q at time K because user Q has been scheduled. 
if user Q is not killed at time K, we actually decrease the average rate of user Q by simply taking a fraction of this. This is a fraction, this is smaller than one, this quantity is smaller than one, right, for any TC positive. So you see that you take a, a smaller a fraction of the average rate at user Q. If Q, uh, the, the average rate uh, uh, at, at time K, if Q is not killed at time K, essentially that average rate here at time K plus one will be smaller than at time K, right? So if a scheduled uh, of user, a certain user Q is not scheduled for a long time, if it's not scheduled for a long time, his average rate over time will decrease progressively, right? Because this quantity is smaller than one. So if it's not scheduled at time K, at time K plus one, the average rate will decrease a little bit. If it's not scheduled at time K plus one, the average rate at time K plus two will decrease a little bit and so on. And so at some point, since we maximize this, the ratio between RK and RK bar, if a certain user Q has not been scheduled for a long time, this quantity here will decrease, right? And so at some point, there is a chance that this ratio will become larger, right? So you have two reasons for this ratio to be large. Either the incentives rate of user Q is large compared to his average rate, or because RQ bar is very low because a certain user has not been scheduled for a long time, right? So this TC parameter will actually have uh, have a big impact on how quickly uh, RQ, uh, the average rate, will decay with with the time. If TC is very large, if TC is very large, you see that actually from time k to time k plus one, this quantity will not change much. If TC is very large, this quantity will be close to one, right? So the average rate will not change much. If TC is very small, on the other hand, if you take TC equal to one, in the extreme case, if TC is equal to one, you see that um, if TC is equal to one, this quantity If TC is equal to one, we have RQ bar K plus one will be equal to RQ K plus zero. Right? So what that means is that if TC is very small, you see that if you have not been scheduled at time K, your average rate now is zero. So that means actually you have a high chance to be scheduled at the next time instance. So if TC is very small, you will be, you will have a tendency to have something like this. If a user Q is killed at this time one, user Q will not be killed at time two, because essentially you're going to have other users will have an average rate of zero. So actually you're going to have something that looks like this, very likely you may have some form of what is called round robin. You don't really care about how strong the incentives rate of a given user is. You will be dictated by the fact that if you have not been scheduled at a certain time instant, your average rate at the next time instance will be equal to zero. So that means your ratio here will become suddenly very large. And so you have a high chance of being scheduled, even if your channel is not very good, right? So. What this gives you is a strategy that is called round robin. Essentially, it tells that whatever your really strength of the channel, you will have very high chance of having something like where your user one will be excluded at a certain time instant, and then you're gonna have a user two, user three, user four. So you will change among those different users. So you don't really pay attention how strong a given channel is. But what you, you care more about is to make sure that each user at each, at each uh, turn, at each time instant, is actually scheduled. So you may have user one, the next time instant I will have another user, and then another user, and so on. If you have a large TC, it will be quite different, because large TC, your average rate will not change much, right? So what may, may happen is that you will have some things where um, maybe for um, a longer period of time, you may have um, 
so here I have time one, two, three, four, and maybe I will have user one and user two, user three, user four scheduled. Here I have one, two, three, four, and maybe I will have user one skill, user one skill, user one skill, user one skill, still, right? Uh, but then after a certain time instance, then it will move to another users. So the difference between those two, the TC is is very large, but the TC is is very small. Is that how long you have to wait for actually a given user to be scheduled? It does not mean that this uh, this one is better than this. Actually, this one is likely to be worse than this one. The reason for this is because here you don't really care about how good a given channel is. What you realize is actually you get an average rate that is very quickly very low, and so you have to be scheduled. So even if your channel is bad, right? So while here, this is very different. Here, your average rate does not change much, so your incidence rate is quite important. So your incidence rate will really dictate whether you have a chance to be scheduled or not. So this uh, having a large TC typically is actually better, but the drawback is that you have to wait longer before you are scheduled. And so sometimes this can also uh, lead to, to some, uh, some latency problem, right? So if you do some, some evaluation, and this is something you're going to have to do in coursework three, and you have uh, size of broadcast channels where you do uh, one user transmission at a time, but you scheduled the user that maximize this ratio here. So you do this, so you do proportional fair scheduling. So it's a fair uh, scheduler, but proportional fair that is proportional means here that you're looking at this ratio between those two. So if you do um, a proportional fair scale where you actually you choose your user Q prime to really maximize at every time instance the ratio between the incidence rate and the average rate. What you will note over a channel that is varying like this, where at time k the channel is actually kind of a, a first order, you know, innovation uh, process, where you have at the channel at time k is equal to the channel at time k minus one plus some innovation nodes, some Gaussian nodes. Right, so your channel is changing here as a function of epsilon. The larger epsilon, uh, the the smaller the change. The smaller the epsilon, the larger the change. Right. So if you do this proportional fair scheduler, and you select the user that maximize this ratio between incidence rate and average rate, what you will see is that the sum rate, right. So the rate of actually the scheduled users every time is actually increasing with the number of users, but the rate of increase depends on the value of TC. So here I have an example where all the users have the same pass loss. They all have the same pass loss, lambda Q is equal to lambda, right? The only thing that's changing is the channel gain, the HK. So H, HQ is uh, independent across the different users, and each channel, right, at a certain time k, evolves like this, right? And what you're looking at is the effect of the sum rate as a function of this scheduling time scale. So what you have here is that the larger TC, the larger the sum rate, the lower TC, the lower the sum rate. And the reason for this is that here, we are not able to really benefit from any multi-user diversity because we always, if you have not been scheduled at a certain time k, you will be scheduled at the next time instance, very likely, irrespectively of how good your channel is. While here, you will really be scheduled whenever your channel is much better than the average. So you will really try to actually be scheduled whenever your channel is good compared to your average, right? So that means actually you will schedule, you will actually leverage some form of multi-user diversity here. You will be scheduled whenever you are close to your peak, right? And so this will lead to some um, multi-user diversity gains, to some increase of the sum rate here with the number of users. If you have TC that is in between, 
well, you will have a gain that is a bit smaller. Now, this also change as a function of epsilon. You see epsilon here is essentially, if you like, a correlation coefficient between two time instants, right? So if epsilon is very small, if epsilon is equal to zero, it means actually there is zero correlation between time instant k minus one and time instant, instant k. So if epsilon is equal to zero, essentially channel at k minus one and k are completely independent from each other. So it's like epsilon equal to zero is very fast changing channel. Epsilon equal to one, if epsilon is equal to one, this term is equal to zero. So this is actually a constant channel. But the channel is not time varying at all, right? Now, if you want to, you know, be scaled close to your peak, right? You want to have the channel that is changing, right? And so that's what you see here with TC equal to 50, is that if you have a channel that is not, uh, that is constant here, or if you have a channel that is changing, well, because your scheduling time scale is finite, that means that you have to typically wait a limited amount of time before you are scheduled. If you have a channel that actually is changing more rapidly, it means that you may have a better chance to actually be scheduled on the peak of that channel, right? If I have something like this, if I have um, time instant, and if I have a channel that is varying very slowly, or if I have a channel that is varying very, very, very quickly, right? Uh, if I have a given time scale, my TC is this, right? You see that here, um, my channels will change very slowly across TC. So that means actually I will have uh, if I'm if I have a good channel condition is okay, but if I'm in a bad channel condition, uh, I will have less chance to be to be scheduled. Well, here if my I have the same TC, the same value of TC, here what's happening is that um, within that time scale TC, I'm likely to 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 see some good channel realization, and so I will definitely be scheduled when I'm close to those peaks here, right? So. When TC is fixed, the performance is better when your actually channel is changing more rapidly, simply because you actually able to actually uh, experience more peaks. You have a higher chance of, of seeing some peaks of your channel realizations. Okay, and that, that, that will lead to a some rate increase. Right, so this is an important figure. Um, you will have to be able to first reproduce that figure um, on MATLAB before you start doing uh, coursework three. So you will see in coursework three description, there is a lot of different items that you have to really try to master and be able to, to do before you can really jump into do coursework three. And this is one of them. I think being able to reproduce this will really help you uh, a lot in coursework three. Um, but in course, you, you will have something that is more complicated than that. So um, here, this is something that you really have to implement and you will have a grasp of how to implement this. What is the effect of the TC? Um, and what is the effect of the number of user? What is the effect of the uh, epsilon? Now you will see that in coursework three things, actually the results will be not exactly in line with this. And the reason is, in this figure, you assume that all the users have the same channel gain. In the um, coursework three, all the users will not have the same channel gains. Right, so they actually gain versus epsilon uh, versus TC will change a bit. But the main idea, understanding how it works, will be very beneficial uh, if you can reproduce uh, that here. Um, Right, so you will see also that, that when you implement this, at time zero, you're going to have to initialize your scheduler, right? So at time zero, you're going to have to initialize this. And as time increases, this quantity will be updated, right? 
So when you do this kind of um, scheduling here, you will have a whole phase where your average rate is not stable. So you will see that your average rate will actually over time, will actually at first will actually fluctuate and will increase a bit. And then at some point will actually become stable, right? So in your coursework, you're gonna have to discard the first part, or it means that you're gonna have to take drops here that are sufficiently long so that this part does not really influence the total results that you have, right? So you will see when you read coursework three that you're gonna have to take drops that are sufficiently long in order to um, have the initialization to be uh, negligible to have a negligible impact on the whole performance, right? So you will initialize this, right? And at every k, your RQ bar will actually move and, and will increase. And at some point, it will stabilize around a certain value. It will keep fluctuating a bit, but it will be around a certain values, right? Um, so you will see this once you implement that. Right, um, any questions here? Any questions so far? No? Okay. So, um, so let's have a break here. Oh, sorry, someone had a question. Yes, uh, Tinger. Please tell me. Uh. Bruno, I have a question about the the average. How it's a uh, how to like calculate the average in in a time scale. I mean the the length of the time scale to calculate the average because it's a long term average. And how you calculate this average? I mean not not this not this formula because you you have to know the channel channel gain of this average, right? To, to get this average. So, so, so you, you don't have, to, this is, this is not, this is actually, um, you, you, it's called long-term average here because this, this actually changed very slowly compared to the incendiousness rates, right? So essentially what will happen is, is the following. Imagine that you are time zero, right? At time zero, nobody has been scheduled before. So your average rate will be equal to zero for all the users. Okay? Okay. Now, now then you go to time one. Time one. Then you're going to have here, your denominator will be zero for all the users. So one of the users suddenly will be scheduled. Right? So you see that actually now, let's say user one will be scheduled. So now the user one average rate here will be equal to that was zero. And this is now R1. So user one average rate will not change, right? Uh, then you go to, you, to time two. And time two, still some other users, let, let me write this down completely. Right, for instance, uh, let's let's have we have a uh, time zero, time one, time two, and so on. Let's imagine I have user one, user two, user three, user four. Right. So at time zero, the rate of all the users uh, for all Q uh, is equal to zero. Right? Because we have never been scheduled before. Right? So at time zero you will actually scale one of the users. So let's imagine user Q is scheduled here, right? So at time one, RQ bar, so RQ bar of uh, time one uh, is, is zero for two, three, and four, and is non-zero for user one, right? Because it's been scheduled here, right? So at time one, now I will try to find the, the user that maximum the ratio between RQ and RQ and the average rate, uh, because some of the users have zero, one of those three users will be scheduled. So for instance, let's imagine it's user three, right? Now you move to time two. Now time two, 
RQ bar at time two is zero for Q equal to two and four, as in non-zero for Q equal to one and three, right? That clear? Ginger? So if there are zeros, that means that it's very likely that it's going to be scheduled, right? So oh. one of those will be scheduled, so probably user two and so on. At some point here, you see after four time instance, things will be start being different because you see all those average rate now will be non-zero, right? So now you, you continue, the average will be non-zero and for each time instant, you will actually update your average rate using that, right? So that's why you're going to have the average rate of user one will start from zero, right? And then we'll increase a bit and then we we'll increase more. And at some point we'll stabilize, right? So you see some large fluctuation and then it will stabilize. Oh, right? Okay, thank you. Right, so, so that's why K is actually a time instant. You're going to have to take long drops so in your in your coursework three, you're going to have to generate the chance using something like this, right? So the value of K will be your time instant. You're going to have to take the value of K here very long, for instance, 10,000, right? So 10,000 instant, for instance. And the longer the TC, the longer the drop going to have to be, because the longer the TC, the longer the TC, the longer it will take time for a given user to be scheduled. But you could take a longer time to be scheduled, that's what he says. But if you have a smaller TC, you could take a drop slightly smaller in length, shorter in length. Okay? So, for instance, uh, generate this with, I don't know, I don't remember what I did here, what was the length, um, but let's say uh, 10,000 or 100,000 instances, right? Um, and so you go, what you're going to have to see is when you look at your average rate of a given user, you're going to have to see how it fluctuates like this and when it becomes stable. And this is maybe the stabilization comes after, I don't know, 500 time instance, right, for instance. OK, so what will become in, important is really the rate that you achieve from time, uh, time instance five, 500 to maybe 10,000. Right? But if you increase your TC, if you take large TC, you're going to have to take longer drops. Right? So in your coursework, you will generate multiple users, at different location, and each user will, you will generate a time varying channel uh, using something like this with that it has to be relatively long, 10,000 symbol duration or 10,000 channel use, something like this, or 100,000. You're going to have to see. Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Good, so let's have a break here and then I will go into pre-coding. So let's, let's resume at uh, 10.20. In the meantime, if you have more questions, please ask. Hello, Professor Bruno. Uh, I want to ask a question about um, uh, the rate. And uh, um, I found that uh, uh, for your for your figure, uh, you change you, you use the different uh, you know the channel metrics HK um, based on the different uh, parameter. But um, um, I think uh, you mentioned that uh, actually the the rate. Uh, it, the, the, the scheduling time is um, only depends on the ratio between the instant, instantaneously 
uh, rate and the long term average rate, uh, which the long term average rate is depends on the time, uh, the the TC and uh, and and the TC. So um, why this HK will uh, give uh, a influence on on this kind of uh, summer rate? Okay, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not sure I grabbed the question. So are you referring to these slides here? Uh, yeah, yes, because I, 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 I still can't understand why this, um, you know, the the different HK will influence the, the summer rate because I mean, your your rate is uh, depends only on the only on the average long term average rate, the ratio between the long term average rate right. and also Okay, yeah. let, let me give you an example. So let's imagine I have. So I have. Um, let me take uh, an example. I have, let's say, two users. So I have a, a time that is K. And I have a user. Um, and I have a channel that does like this, and I have a channel that does like this, okay? And my time instant k is, is here. Let's say uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, okay? Let me take two values of Tc. I take Tc is equal to 1 and TC is very large. OK, so at time zero here, or at time K, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Let me imagine this is this is K, uh, K prime and this is K prime plus one, K prime plus two and, and so on. OK, so you're not at time zero, you're already somewhere, right? Um, okay, let me write this a bit better. So I have uh, I don't know. Uh, this is a time. This is a time k k prime k prime plus one k prime plus two k prime plus three and so on. Okay. So let's imagine that I'm I'm here at time k one t k prime plus one. If I do a rate maximization, I will schedule the green user. Right here. At time one, yeah, I don't care about the average rate. If I do rate maximization, if I do proportional fairness, I'm looking at R Q divided by R Q bar. Okay. Now my R Q bar will depends on the T C. If T C is equal to one, what's going to happen is the following: If at the previous time instance here, if I had a user, let's say if user uh, if, if user one, it, it, let's say user one is the green one. This is user one, this is user two. So at time uh, k prime, at time k prime, user, let's say user one is scheduled. Okay, so at, at this time instant, user one is scheduled. So the question is, at k prime plus one, um, what, which user will I schedule? Well, if I have tc equal to one, if I have tc equal to one, you see that uh, user two will be scheduled. Why do I know that? Because the r2 at time k plus one will be equal to zero from this expression. Right. If TC is equal to one, a user that has not been scheduled at the previous time instant will have an average rate equal to zero at the next time instant. OK, so here, if if I have here at time K prime, I have user one is scheduled, then at time K plus one, the user two average rate will be equal to zero. 
um, this is with t is equal to 1. The user to average would be equal to 0. That means actually r2 divided by r2 bar will be equal to infinity, will be much larger than anything I can have about r1 divided r1 bar will be strictly small infinity because this will be non-zero, right? So this gives you an example here where you see that user 2 at time k prime plus 1 user two will be scheduled, even though his channel is not very good. You see, actually compared to his mean, his channel is not very good, but user two will be scheduled, right? Because he has not been scheduled at previous time instance. Yeah, yes, so so this kind of method, it does not depend on the HK, uh, the, the changing that's, of HK. That's absolutely right. If TC yeah. is very small, the, the, the user you will choose will actually not be really a function of HK. And that's a problem. That's a problem because that means actually you could be scheduled when you have a bad channel, right? If TC is small. And this is the reason why in this curve here, you see if the TC is small, you have actually, even if you have a large number of users and you have the chance of picking up good users, you will not be able to do that. And that's why your sum rate is actually flat. While TC larger than zero is very different. If TC is larger than zero, it means that at time k plus one, let's say user one is scheduled. Right? Now at time k prime plus one, which user will be scheduled? Well, I'm gonna have a one k prime plus one will be roughly equal to a one at time k prime. Right? This is for TC very large. Right, and R two k plus one would be roughly equal to R two k prime. Roughly, it's not exactly the same, but roughly, right? For T C large, right? So now you see that what you're looking at is really not the ratio between R one and R one bar, and R two and R two bar, right? Now, now the the instantaneous rate of user one and user two will play a big role here, right? And you see that for at this time instant here, user one has actually a much better channel compared to its average, compared its average rate, let's say, than user two. User one is actually on, on a good channel realization, while user two is in something that is in is starting to be in a dip, right? So that means actually at time k plus k prime plus one, user one will still be likely scheduled. So we're gonna have user one again. Right now, you go to use to k prime two, right? Well, then you compare the ratio again here, and user one will likely be scheduled again because his channel is very good, right? And you continue like this, right? And at some point, things will things will change because the channels of user two will become better than the channel of user one, relatively speaking, compared to compared to its its average. Right. So this is the reason why, depending on TC, if you like, in short, when TC is very small, the scheduler is not really a function of the incentives rate. So it's not really a function of the how good the incentives channel is. While when TC is larger, the scheduler pays more attention to to this numerator. The numerator plays a big role. So it tries to schedule try to schedule the user when a user is really on good channel realization. And that's the reason why here, when you increase number of users, you have an increase of the sum rate because increase of the sum rate of the number of users means actually you're able to really schedule users when they're actually on good channel realization. So user one here, user two there, and so on. If TC is very small, you will not be able to actually uh, have a schedule that is really a function of the incident, incident channel realization. And so you will have performance that actually are quite, quite weak. So round robin, TC is quite equal to one or, or small, is a bit like a random selection. You just want to make sure that all the users are scheduled. So it's very fair. It's very fair, but the performance is not very good either because you don't care of how good the channels are, right? You say, I have, uh, um, uh, I have 10 users and I will have 
user one at time one, user two at time two, user three at time three, user four at time four, and so on. And then I will go back to user one and so on. I don't really care about how good the channels are. But if TC increasing, I will say, oh, well, I have user one is actually on a good channelization, so I will keep user one, and then user one, user one. And then, well, user two becomes better in terms of the ratio, then I will keep user two, user two, user two, and then switch to user three, maybe, right? But I will pay more attention to actually the, the numerator, right? Does that, does that clarify? Yeah, thank you. That's make a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. So you'll see, um, you really have to practice. You have to actually code this into MATLAB to really see how, how that behaves. Right, good. So let's continue. So that was about essentially this notion of scheduling, which is an important notion when you want to really consider fairness. Um, so you want to have fairness among the user at the same time you want to maximize the performance right so so it's something that is is is, is, is quite important now i gave you this example when you have single antenna so this is a siso the performance here is for siso siso bc right you have one transmitter you have multiple receivers uh, right you can do the same in the siso max so you have multiple transmit multiple transmitters uh, and if you want to transmit transmit only, you want to have only one user at a time to be skilled, you can do that, for instance, right? That will not maximize your sum rate, um, right? Because you know that in the sum rate of the size of Mac, you actually want to have two users that transmit at the same time, but you could do that, right? In the size of BC is different because to maximize the sum rate, you actually have to transmit one user at a time. But if you transmit only to the strong user, always it may not be fair. So that's why uh, scheduling is quite important also. Now you could do this if you have a MIMO. So you could transmit, let's imagine I have now K users, I have a, a system, I have one transmitter, multiple transmit antennas, and now I have different users, multiple receive antennas, right? But I'm constraining myself to transmit to one user at a time. So this is not the best thing you can do, but you could do that. And this is something you do in 4G and in 5G, for instance. So you have three users, but I'm saying I will transmit uh, to those different users, but only one user at a time. So for instance, I will transmit, I have two receive antenna to transmit and then I may transmit one or two streams to user one. And then next time instance, I will transmit one or two streams to user two, and then to user three, right? So you can do exactly the same thing using the proportional fairness, proportional fair scheduler. The proportional fair scheduler will ca calculate which user you need to schedule at a certain time instant, uh, but now your rate will be function of the point-to-point -point MIMO processing that you do. So your instance rate will be function of what kind of receiver you have. Are you having an MMSE receiver, an MMSE SIC receiver? So the rate expression will change and it will depend on how many streams you transmit, right? So you can do that. So this is something you will do in coursework three. So we will have uh, single user transmissions. So you transmit one user at a time, but uh, you have professional fair scheduler and you have multiple transmit antennas and multiple receive antennas. Right? So this can be done. It can be done also when you have you, you still multiple user at the same time. So we'll see this also, but um, this is more challenging and that relates a little bit to, to the bonus question in, in, in coursework three. Okay, so let's now look at uh, some um, modeling, the, the pre-coding techniques. So I mentioned earlier on that when you have a MIMO BC, um, I didn't go into the details of that, but the capacity region is obtained by DPC. Now, a way to achieve uh, good performance, relatively good performance, but without going into complicated DPC, is to use some form of, of pre-coding techniques. And so this is very common in the literature on multi-user MIMO. Um, right? So this was very popular information theory with perfect CSIT, the DPC was shown to be capacity achieving in 2005, 2006, right? Um, then around that time, 
a lot of different multi-user MIMO techniques were developed, right, uh, between the 2000, early 2000 to 2010. A lot of multi-user MIMO techniques were, were developed. Um, so when you have multiple transmit antennas and multiple users, but you don't want necessarily to use the DPC techniques, you want to use uh, linear precoding. And so we're going to look at some of them here, uh, the simplest one. Right, so let's look at this scenario. I have uh, anti transmit antennas. I may have potentially multiple receive antennas at the receiver. I have a receive observation vector for user Q that is, uh, that is a vector here because I have multiple receive antennas. And I have a transmit signal vector here uh, that I have to calculate, I have to compute. So the APC could be one of them, but I may have other methods. And I have the channel matrix for user Q. Same as before, I could potentially view this C prime as a superposition of K messages, uh, a K uh, because I have K users, right? And there is still a prime there because there could be some form of processing there. Right. So let me write write this down C prime uh, into more details using precoding. So now I will assume that I have. Uh, precoding techniques, so I will have a kind of linear relationship between my transmitted streams or the streams that I have and the one that I really want to transmit. So this is my stream I want to transmit, for instance, let's say those are could be QPSK streams, 16 quant streams, and they include the streams intended to um, to those different different users. And I have here a precoder, right? The precoder is the same idea as what we have in point to point. Um, it will be a precoder that will essentially tell you um, in what directions you want a certain stream to be transmitted and uh, with what power level. Okay, so, um, so what is the, the length of C here? Uh, C will have a length that is uh, that is equal to the number of streams that I want to transmit. So I have here, for instance, let me give you directly some example so that you, you understand. Right. So let's imagine that I have a system where I have this. I have a transmitter that I have, uh, for instance, four antennas and I have a receiver I have uh, three receivers. Let's say they have single antennas, but you can have multiple of them. Right? So I want to transmit one stream here, one stream there, one stream there. So totally, for instance, I will have three streams I want to transmit. N E is equal to three. It's the total number of streams that I want to transmit. Okay? So now I will create a precoder. So I will have a C. That will be dimension three by one, right? I will have essentially three streams I want to transmit, and I will have a precoder that will be dimension four by three, because I have three streams, but I have four transmit antennas. Okay, so I'm going to have P multiplied by C will be uh, three columns here. I can decode by P1, P2, P3. So this is going to be. Uh, and this is going to be here C1, C2, C3, three different streams. So my PC here, P multiplied by C will be equal multiplied by C will be P1, C1 plus P2, C2 plus P3, C3. Okay, so what that means here, I will create a certain precoder. So let's say I will create a certain beam along P1 with a certain prolocation, P2 and P3. And uh, along C1, uh, along P1, I will transmit C1, along P2, I will transmit C2, along P3, I will transmit C3. Okay, during using those uh, three different precoders, one precoders for each of those uh, symbols that I transmit, okay, for each of those streams. So this is what I have here. I have K is my scheduled user set. So it's the set of users I want to transmit information to, right? 
for instance, I could have a fourth user, right? But at a certain time instant, I will actually not transmit information to that user. So I may have a set of one, two, three, four, but at a certain time instant, maybe I will transmit only to three of them, a subset of them. Right, so here you see in this example, I'm not transmitting to one user at a time. I, I am here allowing to transit multiple users at the same time. So this is really multi-user MIMO, right? You transmit, you're using multiple antennas to transmit to multiple users at the same time. And each of those streams will be precoded by a certain precoding matrix or precoding vector. Um, if you have multiple streams here, multiple antennas here, and you transmit maybe multiple streams to a given users, then um, you could have a precoding uh, matrix uh, vector here for user one that is not just a vector; it could be a matrix because you may want to transmit multiple streams to that user. Right. Um, so this is what is reflected here. So K is the, the set of users I want to transmit to at a certain time instance. And I will have a certain precoding matrix for user Q and a precoding vector for user uh, um, uh, um, vector of streams of user Q. Right. So now let's look at the received observation. The received observation uh, at user Q. So I will have uh, user Q uh, Y. So let's forget the W for the time being, the, the G for the time being. Y of Q, so the receive observation that user Q, will be equal to its in intended uh, signal that is traveling through user Q channel, where this is the precoder of user Q. And I split into two parts here to highlight two things. This is a direction, this is the par location. So this is, let's say, vectors like this. This is par location. It tells you, it's a diagonal matrix, it tells you how much power is allocated to that vector how much power is allocated to that vector, right? So this PQ performs jointly the power location to the different streams and the directions, right? This is something we, we talked about uh, before. Um, good, so, so that's my precoder. What do I have left here? I now have multi-user interference or intercell interference. I have, I'm looking at it from user Q perspective and I'm having interference from the precoder of the streams of user P, right? I'm looking at user Q perspective. Let's look at, imagine a user one perspective, and I'm seeing interference from the stream of user two and the streams of user three. This is what I have here. The sum over all scheduled users, but with P different than Q. So if I'm losing Q is equal to one in this example, for instance, I will look at, I will see interference from P different than Q. So I will see interference from uh, streams intended to user two and stream intended to user three, right? So that's going to be my multi-user interference. Okay. So what will be my rate? So what is the rate I'm going to, uh, sorry, one more thing. So this is the case I have Y of Q. Now, if I have multiple receive antennas, I could apply a combiner here, G of Q. So I will have a precoder P of Q and I have a combiner G of Q. I can, I can design. Um, that combiner could be, based, for instance, based on, on MMSC. Right? So I designed this combiner. And so now I have an observation after combining, that is Z of Q. Uh, which is my receive observation, but now it's been multiplied by G of Q. Okay, so what's the difference with what we had before? When we had point-to-point -point MIMO, this whole term was gone, in a way, right? Uh, we didn't have this because we had only multiple stream transmitted to one user. So we had a stream of user Q that are received by the user Q. And so here I could have some precoding, for instance, and here I could have some combiner, right? But now I have additional, inform, uh, additional interference here. I have interference coming from the core scheduled users. I'm also transmitting multiple stream to multiple users at the same time, so on the same time frequency resource. And that creates multi-user interference, also calls intercell interference. Right, so how can I write now the rate for user Q? Well, the rate of user Q 
will be the sum of the rate of the stream, uh, the, uh, the sum of the rate achieved by each stream of user Q, right? So I have a sum over NU uh, Q. NU Q is the number of streams that actually transmitted to user Q. And each of those streams achieve a certain rate. That rate is a log two one plus SINR. So what is my SINR? The SINR now will be given by the following. I will have here, hidden into this, I will have interstream interference, so the interference between stream that they intended to the same user, and I'm going to have multi-user interference. This interstream interference is something we know already from point-to-point -point MIMO, but additionally, we're going to have multi-user interference. So this is what we see here. I'm going to have my received SINR will be for a stream L, will be the received combiner for stream L of user Q. I'm going to have the precode of user Q and the stream L. That's going to lead to the signal power of the intended stream. And then I'm going to have three terms. One term that is the uh, noise, that's fine. And I'm going to have the interstream interference and the intercell interference. What is the interstream interference? Is you're looking at user Q perspective, right? Um, but you're looking at streams intended to use a Q that create interference to the stream L of user Q, right? If I transmit two streams to user Q, well, if I want to decode stream one, stream two will create interference to stream one. This is what it says here. If I'm looking at stream one of user Q, stream two of user Q will create interference to stream one. That's what it says, right? So this is the interstream interference to user Q. This is the intercell interference to user Q. I'm looking at from user Q perspective, and I'm seeing, I'm looking at the interference coming from the data intended to user P, and user P being different than user Q, okay? So if I take this example here, let's say, imagine I have two receive antennas. I have here now two streams for user one, and one stream for user one and user two. And I'm looking at from user one perspective, right? So I'm gonna have for user one, I'm gonna have a log two, one plus rho user one stream one, plus log two, one plus user one stream two. So this is the stream SINR of, of uh, stream two, uh, sorry, stream one. This is the SINR of stream two of user one, okay? When I write the SINR of user stream one, the SINR of stream two, what will I have? A SINR of stream one, a SINR of stream one, we'll see here the interference from the stream two of user one, and then we'll see the interference here from the data of user two, the data of user three, that will create interference to user one. Right? Is that clear? So let me take um, let me take an example of what I just said. So let me imagine I have P one is now a four by two matrix. P3, P2 is a four by one mi vector. P3 is a four by one, right? I have P1 multiplied by C1 plus P2 multiplied by C2 plus P3 multiplied by C3, right? This is C11 and C12. I have two stream for user one. So I can write this again as P11, C11, plus P12, C12, plus P2, C2, plus P3, C3, okay? I have a transmitter with four antennas. I have receiver one with two receive antennas, receiver two, one antenna, receiver three, 
one antenna, one stream goes here, one stream goes there. So let me change color. This stream in green is this one. This stream in red is this one. Um, and this stream in, in yellow here are the two streams here I transmit to user one. Okay, right, so this is what I transmit. So this is my P multiplied by C. Right, so now I'm user one. The vector of user one, I have to receive observation. So I have the channel of user one. This is H1, is a matrix. H1, P11, C11, plus H1, P12, C12, plus H1, P2, C2, plus uh, H1, P3, C3. Right. Let me apply a combiner for stream one. I apply a combiner, user one, stream one. So I have G111, 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 and G111. Okay. Now, this is a combiner for stream one of user one. So my intended stream is there. All those ones here are interference. And I have some noise, obviously. I just ignore the noise here. But those are interference. So this is, I'm going to have, when I write SINR, of user one stream one, right? So this is my row one 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 um, that I had here. Row one 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 will be this term here, the strength of this term divided by the strength of this term here. This will be interstream interference plus the strength, the power of this term here will be IC into cell interference. Is that clear? Right. Hope it's clear. Difficult to see your reaction. Um, right, so let me explain you. Now, what do we want to do? How do we design those P now? Right. Um, so there are multiple methods for that. And in the book, chapter 12, if you're interested, you have, I don't know, tens of pages on how to design that. Um, there are many different uh, good designs. But let me maybe explain you. Um, and some of them are called, uh, you can do maximum informing uh, or maximum ratio transmission. So you just don't care about interference. You just try to maximize your signal strength, you can do zero forcing beam forming, regular zero forcing beam forming, block diagonalization, and, and, and so on. Let me give you one example based on zero forcing beam forming because this is probably the most popular one. And let me simplify a, a bit further. Let me imagine that I have only one receive antenna for each of those users, right? So in that case, I'm going to have only one precoder and one stream for user one. I don't need the second stream, right? So in that case, what you can do for multiple receive antennas as well, the zero forcing approach can be extended. Right? But let me imagine for simplicity that I have, I have this. Um, P, so I'm writing now P1C1 plus P2C2 plus P3, C3, and, and this is just a, a, a vector, vectors, vectors. Uh, so I have a transmitter, four antennas, and I have multiple receivers, but now let's assume each of them has single receive antennas. Okay, so let me take this system model here. If I have single receive antenna, I don't even need this combiner, so I have Y1 will be equal to, now I have a vector here, Right, so H1 is a vector, so I can I can write H1, uh, P1, C1 plus H H2, P2, C2. Uh, oh, sorry, H1, P2, C2 plus H1, P3, C3. Okay, this is a vector. H1 is a vector like this. Right, is let's say is a four by one by four vector. Right, I have only one receive antenna. So this is one by four. 
P1 is a four by one, right? Same as what we had here. Uh, I have only one stream I transmit, so now it's four by one, four by one, four by one. So they're all four by one here. Right. So what is the zero forcing being forming? Same idea as the zero forcing receiver. What do you see here? When I'm looking at the stream, the observation of user one, I have the intended signal power. So I'm going to have a SINR here. That will be something like H1 P1 square divided by H1 P2 square plus H1 P3 square plus some noise. This is what you have in this equation here. Right. Um, where here I distinguish the W and the S, so that's the power location, that's the direction, but it's actually exactly the same as this. So here I include the power location and direction into one precoder, right? And H include the pass loss as well. So it's the same expression, but written slightly differently. Right, so if I have this, one way to, to design the P is the following, based on zero forcing. So you remember zero forcing receiver, we designed the receiver so that we want to force any interference to zero. Here's the same thing, but we do this at the transmitter side, the precoding. We want to design the precoder so that we force any interference to zero. So where is my interference here? Is this, this is an interference. I want to force this to zero. This is an interference. I want to force this to zero, right? So I have here, uh, H1 is a one by four vector. And P2 is a uh, four by one vector. So I want to have H1 P2 to be equal to zero. I want to have H1 P3 equal to zero. But otherwise, I want P2 to be orthogonal to H1, and I want P3 to be orthogonal to H1, right? That's what the zero forcing would do, right? And in this case, it's possible. Why? Because I have four transmit antennas, right? And I have two interfering source. So if I have four transmit antennas, we'll have uh, we'll have uh, dimension three dimensional space. So I'm gonna I actually could fit three you know linearly independent vectors that will be orthogonal to H1. So P2 will be orthogonal to H1. Uh, P3, we can be orthogonal to H1 as well, and, and, and so on. So that's the idea of zero forcing, is to force, zero forcing informing, to force any interference to zero. So how do we do that? We do this by doing simply an inverse. We do an inverse. So we actually take our channel matrix. Um, uh, let me write this slightly. Uh, uh, let me write this uh, uh, first. Show you um, uh, qualitatively what we do. So we have, let's say, two vectors like this, right? This is H1 and H2. And now, what I want to do here, you see, that I want P2 to be orthogonal to H1, right? If I'm looking at this from user two perspective, from user two perspective, I will want to have uh, the P1 to be orthogonal to H2, right? So if I have a two user scenario, like I have in this scenario here, I'm gonna have H1, H1 P2 equal to zero, and I want H2 P1 equal to zero, right? If I, if I have a two user scenario with two streams that I transmit, I want the precoder for user two to be orthogonal to the channels of user one, so that the precoder of user two will not create any interference at user one. I want the precoder of user one to be orthogonal to the channels of user two, so that the precoder of user one will not create any, create any interference to user two, right? So here in these three users, for user one perspective, I want this, right? From user two perspective, I want P1, I want H2, P1 to be equal to zero. I want H3, uh, H2, P3 equal to zero. Right. And so on. So you see that you want to force any multi-user interference to zero. Right. 
So how do we do that? Well, is by finding vectors that are orthogonal to the channels. This example here, um, I have H1 here. That's the direction of H1. That's the direction of H2. And now I will design the precoder for W1, for user 1, which is the direction of, of P1. W1 and P1 is the same thing, is the direction. Um, so the direction will have to be orthogonal to H2. The direction of user 2, precoder, will be orthogonal to H1. Okay, this is what we want to do. Um, and so obviously, if you have two channels like this where H1 and H2 are already orthogonal to each other, or closely orthogonal to each other, things are easier. Because uh, if W1, if H1 is already orthogonal to H2, then I could choose W1 to be aligned to H1, and W1 will also be orthogonal to H2. That would be good. Right. Ideally, what I would like to have is if I transmit along W1 here, I would like W1 to be also close to H1 because W1 is the precoder of user 1. So W1 wants to maximize, transmit a lot of energy to user 1, but at the same time does not want to create any interference to user 2. Right. So W1 will be orthogonal to H2 but it would be better if W1 is closer to H1 so that it delivers more energy to user 1. Okay, so if you have two channels, user 1 and user 2 channels actually already orthogonal to each other, things are quite easy. If I have two channels and I have a user 1 is, uh, is, is here and user 2 is there, if I create a beam into that direction, that will maximize the energy here, but at the same time does not create any interference to that user there, that's good. And this is possible if those two channels are orthogonal to each other. So if the two channels are already orthogonal to each other, it's very easy to transmit the precode that it is aligned to the channels of user one, and at the same time does not create any interference to user two. But if you have two channels that are non-orthogonal, like in this case here, you see those two are non-orthogonal typically, then if you simply transmit something along the channels of user one, if you transmit something along W H1, this will create an interference to H2 because H1 is not orthogonal to H2. So that's why you want with zero forcing beam forming to design your precoder, not necessarily aligned with the H1, but being really orthogonal to H2 so that W1 will not create any interference to H2. Right, so that's the idea. You really want your precoders to be orthogonal to the channels of the core scheduled users. So how we do that? By doing a pseudo inverse. We're doing a pseudo inverse in the same way as we do the pseudo inverse for the um, for the point to point zero forcing receiver. Now we can do a pseudo inverse uh, at the transmitter, where we're going to inverse the the chance of of the 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 multi user channel. So what is this H here? Is the multi-user channels is the set of channels of the user. So uh, H here uh, going to be uh, the channels of the user I, right? Um, and I'm going to have multiple of them, and I create this concatenated matrix that I want to invert, essentially. And by inverting this, essentially, I will get rid of all the multi-user interference, and each user will receive is intended streams interference free. So I will go into this to more detail in uh, last lecture uh, next week. Right, uh, thank you for your time. That's it for today. Um, as usual, contact us if you have any questions um, and otherwise have a nice day. Ginger, uh, you have a question? Yes. Oh, it's a question about the average rate again. Uh, uh, okay. Let's uh, let's go to let's go to the, the figure you draw before you, you explain the fairness about the about the rate. This one? Not not this one. It's the pure previous one. Uh, um, I remember you draw like yeah this one. Yeah. Uh, the the dot the dot the dotted line is about is the average rate in this figure, right? Right. So so 
it is is a kind of error. It's not exactly that. It's yeah, 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 yeah. Quali- It's a bit qualitative, right? So, yeah. so this is actually the channel gain. I say this is the average, the mean. Actually, what strictly speaking, you should do, you should go from the channel gain to the R one or to the R two. Yeah. And 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 you should compute an average rate R two bar, which which roughly will lie somewhere in the middle of the the R two will be yes. if you. Because the the average rate is calculated by iterations, not not that's because right. we, we we don't know the futures about the rate. So that's so, that's that's yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That that's, that's what I'm confusing about is this figure. It's a uh, the question right. I asked before. Yeah. Oh right. Yeah. So so what I mean here by this dotted line, yes, is this average rate here, but qualitatively you can imagine, it is an average rate means, uh, you you have you have a you have a chance that will vary, and and actually the average rate is the accumulated rate that you get over time that it has been weighted, um, and so you're looking at when your channel is good compared to to this average rate. So it's a little bit related qualitatively to when is your your channel here good compared to its average channel gain. That's right. Looking at this is a bit related to. One is your channel good compared to the average channel gain, uh, qualitatively. Right. Oh yeah. But but exactly the way you should do um, is really by by doing that. So you, you compute really the rates of user two. You divide by its average rates, um, and so you're looking at when is the incentive rate good compared to actually this long term average rate. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. It's more clear now. Okay. Good. Thank you for your time. Uh, Take good care of yourself, and I see you next uh, next week. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.